carve a few Chinese lattice windows to frame the harmony between heaven and humankind. Build a long corridor of the East to reach the innermost depths of history and culture. It is a meandering melody of Suzhou music, sung with grace and elegance. It is some simple sketches of mountains and forests, not wanting in detail and delicacy. Pick a thousand pieces of lakeside rock in all shapes and contours. Take a share of the Suzhou waters with all the mist and haze. Paint a dozen scrolls of floral light and watery shadow. Write a few chapters about the fading years and distant times. Emperor Huizong of Song was a romantic emperor in Chinese history. Gifted in painting and calligraphy, he did many paintings of flowers and birds in the realist Gongbi style and created a unique calligraphic style known as slim gold. Because most of Emperor Huizong's children were female, he felt a lack of male heir. He listened to the advice of geomancers and believed that it was all because the northeastern part of the capital city of Kaifeng was too low in altitude. To correct the imbalance, he issued an edict ordering that an imperial garden with a mountainous name, Kenyue, be built in that area. He then decreed that famous rocks and trees be requisitioned nationwide and shipped to Kaifeng, the influential garden builder Chu Mian, who happened to be a native of Suzhou, was very knowledgeable about the natural resources of the Lake Tai area near his hometown. He established a local bureau of tributes and began collecting garden building materials, featuring especially the rocks of Lake Tai. The vast waters of Lake Tai are famous far and near for its rocks. Due to ages of erosion by wind and water, the rocks here are known for their crisscross patterns and extraordinary shapes. Inevitably, these rocks bore the brunt of Genyue Garden Project. Not only were these beautiful Lake Tai rocks dredged up in large quantities, famous rocks that belonged to private owners were also targeted, with heavy penalty for those who dared to resist. The transportation of the colossal rocks was a tragic odyssey. Some of the Lake Tai rocks measured as tall as 40 feet. They were hauled onto huge barges, which were then tugged along the Grand Canal by thousands of trackers. All floodgates and bridges that stood in the way were taken down. That was how the mountains of Lake Tai traveled to distant Kaifeng on the water of the Grand Canal. This was the notorious Garden Rock Tribute in Chinese history. But as the construction dragged on for months and years, under the corrupt and incompetent northern Song government, the project was never finished before it was destroyed in the fall of the royal house in 1127. Rocks that did not get shipped were left to litter the country south of the Yangtze. Classical gardens in this part of the country are known to be locations of the so-called four great rocks. These are Auspicious Cloud Peak on the campus of Number 10 Suzhou Middle School, Crown Cloud Peak in the Lingering Garden of Suzhou, Jade Carving in the Yu Garden of Shanghai, and Wrinkled Cloud Peak on the West Lake of Hangzhou. Of these four, the most famous and most legendary is Auspicious Cloud Peak, towering over what once was the grounds of the Textile Bureau and now the campus of the Number 10 Suzhou Middle School. Auspicious Cloud Peak is the most outstanding rock in all of our gardens in Suzhou, or even the entire Lower Yangtze Valley. 
There are quite a few miraculous tales about this rock. Generally speaking, we call the Lake Tai rocks in our Suzhou gardens remnants of the Garden Rock tribute. Be it crown cloud or auspicious cloud, they all came from Lake Tai. For instance, auspicious cloud came from the Turtle Mountain on Lake Tai. But before it was shipped to Kaifeng, Zhu Mian got into trouble and was exiled. The rock was deserted in the wilderness. Its base fell into the lake. During the interim years between the end of Northern Song and beginning of Ming, a rich man named Dong Fen from Nanchun County, Huzhou, in today's Zhejiang province, acquired this rock. Later, his daughter was married to Xu Taishi of Suzhou, who was the owner of the Eastern Garden, which is today's lingering garden. According to one popular saying, the rock came as the daughter's dowry. When it was being shipped to Suzhou across Lake Tai, the barge ran into a sudden storm and capsized, so the rock fell into the lake. Dong Fen organized a labor force to retrieve it. As luck would have it, not only was auspicious cloud retrieved, but its base, which had sunk into the lake at the end of the northern Song, was also salvaged. These were then shipped to Suzhou and placed in the eastern garden. During the reign of the Qing Emperor Qianlong, what in the Ming Dynasty was the residence of Prime Minister Wang Ao, and is today the campus of Number 10 Suzhou Middle School, became the site of the Textile Bureau. Each time Emperor Qianlong toured the south of the Yangtze, he would stay here, turning the place into his temporary residence. It was then that the rock was moved from the Eastern Garden to the Emperor's Residential Garden. The classical gardens of Suzhou are also known as the Scholar Gardens of Mountain and Water. One can imagine how important mountain and water are to these gardens. Garden builders of ancient China gave clear definitions of these elements when they said, Rockery is the bone and water the artery of a garden. Rockery is the symbolic synonym for mountain. Scholars of different ages have given succinct summaries of the aesthetic features of Lake Tai rocks. Of these summaries, the four-character epigram of the Song Dynasty calligrapher painter Mi Fu is superior to all others. The four characters are Shou, or slenderness, Lo, pores, Tou, cavities, and Zhou, wrinkles. Slenderness symbolizes moral uprightness. Pores symbolize the free flow of lifeblood. Cavities suggest transparency, and wrinkles suggest plasticity. As we all know, one of the most common ways of appreciating a rock is to see whether it resembles some other natural object. But the appreciation of Lake Tai rocks is aesthetics on a higher plane. That is because most of the Lake Tai rocks are manifestations of mental states and personalities. As sculptures of nature, their forms leave ample room for the imagination. Their angularity, their abrupt contours, though highly symbolic and abstract, are all embodiments of personalities in the eyes of the viewers. It is in the images of these rocks that the scholar officials, who had retired into their residential gardens, found their true self and their spiritual sustenance. In traditional Chinese culture, the rock or stone is at once a specific object and a unique symbol. It evokes the myth of Nu Wa, the co-creator mending the sky with rainbow-colored stones, the story of the mythical bird Jing Wei trying to fill the sea with pebbles, and the image of the monkey king born of a mammoth rock. The immortal classical fiction A Dream of Red Mansions is actually also known as the story of the stone. Thanks to water, the lower Yangtze Valley is filled with vitality. Thanks to water, the gardens of Suzhou are charged with inspiration. The water in the gardens is still, but the way the water surface is organized by the garden designers is full of variations. Such creative use of water is known as water design. If we look at all the Suzhou gardens, we will find that the way the pavilion of Surging Waves Garden incorporates the ancient rivers and streams outside its walls into its scenic beauty is rather exceptional. Most of the gardens have the water on their own grounds as the subject of creative design. This water space simulates the rivers and lakes, the streams and ponds of Mother Nature. It plays with the shadows and reflections of the buildings 
and plants of all seasons that surround it. Simplicity is a major principle in the arts of the East. The water design of Suzhou Gardens applies this principle to great advantage. The water surface of the Master of Fishing Nets Gardens totals a mere 400 square meters, but because it finds a resonance with the surrounding objects and builds a waterscape with its own personality, it is able to create the undulating effect of a vast lake. As for the much larger humble administrator's garden, its lake, with all the artificial islets and bridges, recreates the typical scenery of the water country south of the Yangtze. The lake, in its turn, magnifies the sense of space of this prestigious Chinese garden. Water is a symbol of the garden's beauty. Water is also the living soul of the garden. Many outstanding architects and garden builders in Chinese history came from the lower Yangtze River Valley particularly from Suzhou. That Suzhou native, Zhu Mian, who built the Genyue Imperial Garden, though generally dismissed as a sycophant, was after all a master garden builder. It is most unlikely that people would associate this inconspicuous ancient-style structure near the waters of Lake Tai with the magnificent forbidden city in Beijing. Buried here, however, is no other than the designer and builder of the forbidden city Kuai Xiang, the world-famous gate tower of Tiananmen, was Kuai's masterpiece. Most of the artisans who built the Ming Palace came from Kuai's hometown, Xiangshan Fragrance Hill, of Wu County on the banks of the Lake Tai. That is why artisans of Xiangshan become one of the most frequent expressions in the annals of Chinese architecture since Ming and Qing. The lineage of Xiangshan artisans has continued to this day. Their craftsmanship remains the most coveted. This makes one feel deeply convinced that it is no accident that the gardens of Suzhou are the best south of the Yangtze, and the gardens south of the Yangtze are the best under heaven. The term Shangshan School has been in existence for a long time. Its fame was established during the Ming Dynasty, with Kuai Xiang's design of Tiananmen and its construction of the Forbidden City. Actually, this school of artisans was quite popular even before that. Why was it had to do with its geographical setting. Xiangshan is the name of an area that stretches along the Qionglong Mountains. It is about a dozen kilometers in length and not very wide. The narrowest place only a few hundred meters. With the Qionglong Mountains to the north and Lake Tai to the south, it is a small place with a large population. Many male laborers made a living as construction workers so that the place became known as a town of builders. After many years of modifications, or shall we say after much tempering and construction practice, the unique architectural style, the Suzhou style, evolved, which is the classical architectural style of the Suzhou Gardens. One should say that all the Suzhou Gardens we see today whether they are designated world cultural heritages or just ordinary garden architecture, have their origins in the style of this school. If among the ancient architects and garden builders, Kuai Xiang specialized in building palaces, then Qi Cheng, another Ming Dynasty native of Suzhou, truly specialized in the realm of garden building. Ji Cheng lived during the Wanli reign of the Ming Dynasty. He was well versed in poetry and painting. He was especially accomplished in the art of garden building, having created several famous gardens for the rich and powerful in the lower Yangtze Valley. While he was staying in the Garden of Awakening in Yangzhou, he completed the world's earliest treatise on garden building, Yuan Ye. In it, he gives a comprehensive summary of the various garden building experiences and detailed expositions from the general principles of layout to individual designs. From the major components of a garden to techniques of construction, many of the illustrations are actual examples of the then existing gardens south of the Yangtze. Later the book became known in Japan and Europe and was considered by foreign specialists as the master text on garden building. 
Another famous work on garden building is Records of Things Superfluous by Wen Zhengheng, great-grandson of Suzhou artist Wen Zhengming. Inheriting his ancestor's style, Wen Zhengheng applied the principles of landscape painting to the art of garden building. The book consists of 12 drawn discussing such matters as garden architecture, horticulture, use of Lake Tai rocks, and interior decor. It is yet another immortal work in the history of garden building. It contains such quotable lines as, A single rock stands for 10,000 feet high Mount Hua. A single ladle contains 10,000 miles of rivers and lakes. Unfortunately, one Zheng Heng's masterpiece on gardens is no longer extant. The Art Orchard was originally called Garden of Medicinal Herbs. Growing medicinal herbs in a garden reveals the garden owner's spiritual yearning for nature as well as his humanitarian concerns. The garden was laid to waste more than once. After repeated renovation, especially the restoration project of 1982-84, it has by and large resumed its original grace. Thanks to its proportionate and harmonious design, this relatively small garden gives one a sense of expansiveness. The fish nursing kiosk stands out on the water as a counterpoint to the row of waterside pavilions, an ideal spot to feed the fish. This is how some people have described the art orchard. The water here is just one corner of the 600,000 acre Lake Tai. The rockery here is just one of the 72 peaks around the lake. The garden's blood vessels fill with its water. The garden's skeleton stands tall with its rockery. These fantastically shaped rocks fall largely into two categories, lake stones and yellow stones. They are gathered here to be erected or assembled. In the Suzhou gardens, most of the single peak rocks are made to stand by themselves such as the crown cloud peak of the lingering garden. The massive rockeries with their cliffs and ravines are the results of assembling. Due to technological limitations in excavation and transportation at the time the gardens were built, the rocks that were used were generally speaking not huge, but to pile them up one by one to make an integral whole took a great deal of skillful assemblage and meticulous installation. Rockery piling is not only heavy physical labor, but a unique creative art difficult for artisans lacking the special gift. A systematic theory of garden building has gradually evolved, enriching as well as promoting the garden building experience. At the same time, it has nurtured a series of garden specialists, including experts in rockery building. The Qing dynasty produced two most outstanding masters of rockery building, Zhang Nanyuan and Ge Yuliang. The only existing work by Zhang is the Yellowstone hillock in the Twin Gardens. From a low angle, high angle and eye level views, he created the artistic effects of height, depth and distance. Indeed, Ge internalized all the famous mountains and caves he had seen and then manipulated the rocks like a painter's brush to create this immortal masterpiece. Contemporary garden expert Mr. Cheng Chongzhou says, A real mountain is remarkable when it looks artificial. An artificial mountain is fabulous when it appears real. Chinese gardens have hosted many great works of artificial mountains, but among those still standing, the one in the mountain villa of circular grace is considered number one. There is plenty of rainfall south of the Yangtze River. The city of Suzhou is crisscrossed with a network of water, such that it cannot but be known as a water town. Gardens cannot survive without water. The people of Suzhou enjoy all the blessings of heaven and earth when it comes to gardens. Still, everything has its quantitative limits. In the rainy season, water overflows. In the hot summer, it evaporates. Both the rise and fall of water level requires some tough thinking to control. The garden specialists have accumulated plenty of experience in that regard. 
Originally, the bodies of water inside the gardens were connected with the rivers and canals outside the garden walls. That was how the quality of the water was maintained and the excessive rainwater was drained. But in the past few decades, many of the waterways silted and the ponds in the gardens became pools of dead water. To prevent the deterioration of water quality, fish and water plants were put in. In addition, the traditional practice of digging wells at the bottom of the ponds still continues. According to data supplied by the Departments of Gardens and Cultural Relics of Suzhou, there are two wells at the bottom of the pond in the Garden of Happiness, and underwater wells have also been found in the Humble Administrator's Garden, Lion Grove Garden, Carefree Garden, and others. These wells facilitate the interflow between surface and subterranean water. The garden builders of Suzhou have carefully constructed an interdependent relationship between the rockery and the pond. To adapt to the fluctuating water level of the pond, they have arranged the rocks along the banks in a sequence of descending steps. This way, when the water is full, the bank does not appear impinged upon, and when the water is low, the pond does not look impoverished either. The source and tail end of the water are often hidden at the turns of the pathways or between the waterside pavilions and the floral hedges. That not only adds to the poetic ambience of light and shade between flower and water, but extends the water space beyond the frames of the landscape. Chinese culture with its rich heritage is a joint product of the vertical extension of history and the horizontal integration of regionality. This characteristic finds marked expressions in the art of classical gardens. The Summer Palace of Beijing, the Summer Resort Mountain Villa of Chengde, the Humble Administrator's Garden and Lingering Garden of Suzhou are known as China's four greatest gardens. Yet, even in the two imperial gardens of the Summer Palace and Summer Mountain Villa, one can find reflections of the gardens south of the Lower Yangtze, especially those in Suzhou. The Summer Palace in Beijing incorporates the best in classical Chinese architecture and encompasses the styles of gardens in different parts of China. It especially adopts the techniques of gardens south of the Lower Yangtze and magnifies them in space. Some of the famous gardens in the south are ingeniously reproduced here. The renowned garden of harmonious interest in the Summer Palace is actually an imitation of the Garden of Ease of Wuxi. Other typical sceneries south of the Lower Yangtze River have also been recreated here. This scenic spot, embraced by mountain and water, is simply called Suzhou Street. Emperor Qianlong built all this to celebrate his mother's 60th birthday. The old lady had been to places south of the Lower Yangtze River and had many fond memories of the sceneries there. So the emperor had a special street built inside the summer palace in imitation of the streets and canals of the water towns south of the Yangtze. He also had the street lined with shops and ordered some of the eunuchs and palace maids to play the roles of delivery boys and customers. All in the style and ambience of Suja. That was how he enabled his mother to recall her visits to that part of the country. The Suzhou street we see now at the foot of the Black Hill of the Summer Palace was burned down in 1900 by the imperialist forces who invaded Beijing to put down the Boxer Rebellion, but was restored in the 1980s. Emperor Qianlong visited the Lower Yangtze Valley six times, visiting Suzhou, Yangzhou, Hangzhou, Jiaxing, Nanjing and many other places. He was especially interested in the gardens in these places. He ordered painters of the Imperial Art Academy to paint the famous scenic sites in these different cities and take the paintings back to Beijing. Many of the scenic spots in the Imperial Gardens in Beijing are either derivatives or replicas of Suzhou Gardens. This is just like the Kunshu Opera and Pingtan Ballad Singing. These are both treasures of Suzhou culture.
but we can hear Ping Tang in Shanghai, as well as in Nanjing, the same way as we find northern and southern varieties of Kunchu. In a broad sense, all the Chinese gardens in the style of the Lower Yangtze belong to the Suzhou lineage. The Summer Mountain Villa in Chengde is another famous imperial garden complex. Seven of the Qing emperors from Kangxi on down came here to spend their summers and administer state affairs, making Chengde the second political center of the nation at the time. As a site of many historical events, it contains rich cultural relics and data for those who wish to study and research the history of the Qing dynasty. Outside the mountain villa is a group of imperial monastic complexes known as the Eight Outer Temples. They encircle the imperial gardens to enhance the vastness of this mountain resort. The summer mountain villa occupies a unique geographical location that features pleasantly cool summer weather and a combination of northern and southern landscape. Such south of Yangtze scenic beauties as the West Lake of Hangzhou, the Golden Mountain Temple of Zhengzhang, and the Misty Rain Tower of Jiaxing find their artistic recreations here. The Pavilion of Surging Waves Garden with water as its theme and the Lion Grove Garden with mountain as its motif are direct replicas from the Suzhou Gardens of the same names. These are examples of how southern landscape converges in the north and Suzhou scenery finds its way into the imperial resort. True, these are proofs of how folk wisdom was appropriated by the emperors of the past, but these acts of appropriation have also extended the horizon of the art of garden building and enriched the interflow between the traditional cultures of north and south. When intent and effect are placed on the scales of history, sometimes the latter carries more weight. However, none of the mountains and lakes here can replace the dreams of Suzhou. The glittering ripples of this water seem to recall the reed catkins flying over Lake Tai. The shadow of this mountain seems to be listening for the distant tolls of the Hanshan Temple Bell. Human beings, who consider themselves superior to all other creatures, have, with the advance of civilization, gradually distanced themselves from Mother Nature, from what is their true home. But just as they gradually sink into the mires of urban prosperity, they begin to realize that in their own blood flows an instinct that passionately yearns for nature. Nowadays, people go hiking in the mountains and wading across waters, or go boating and fishing, these non-productive excursions may start off with modern vehicles of transportation, but their goal is to revisit the childhood of humanity in the distant past. The gardens of Suzhou are the artistic representations of nature. Revisiting humanity's childhood does not all mean a return to the days of slash-and-burn agriculture of rope beds and clay stoves. Otherwise, those extremely gifted scholars and artisans would not have invested their lifeblood and capital funds into designing the waters and tailoring the mountains from generation to generation. 